Praise God, praise God. It is so good to be here in Grafton today. Praise God. I'm not exactly sure how I got here. Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Um, you know, a lot of, uh, we, we travel full time and, and, uh, 99% of the places I go, Pastor, are places I go every year. So this is very strange for me and my wife. We're a little nervous, you know. You don't know us, and we don't know you. And I'm not even sure why I'm here or how I got here or who told who what, where. But I do understand one thing. God knows what he's doing. Praise God. Praise God. And so quite rarely we go new places. And uh, I'm not just saying that. Just It's fairly rare. But um, there's two kinds of churches that we go to. And uh, I guess only time will tell which kind of church this is. But there's the kind of church that has us come back. And there's the kind of churches that don't ever have us come back. Praise God. So, uh, um, God's so good, but, uh, we are excited to be here. We are technically, as you, if you didn't see our booth coming in, we are technically traveling and promoting this book. This has been a many year project and, uh, we are thankful that it was picked up by a major publisher. Um, in February, it was published on February 7th and God has given it favor and uh, it's now being sold in just about every free country in the world. And, um, and I don't say that braggingly. I'm saying that and giving thanks to God. And uh, some of it is due to the message. It's a timely message. It's about loving your neighbor. It's called the second commandment, loving your neighbor in today's changing world. Loving your neighbor in today's changing world. I, I wanted to call it, say, loving your neighbor in today's troubled world, but the publisher wanted it changed to this, and so that's what it was. It's a very simple theology. It is, and it means exactly what it says. We need to love our neighbors. Pastors ask me a lot of places, why, why do we need a book about loving our neighbor? Well, it's pretty simple. Most of us, if not all of us, struggle to love our neighbors. The scripture says, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. It didn't say thou shalt like your neighbor. It said you'll love them. You see, liking your neighbor is based upon likeness. And so we like people that we are alike. But you will never be like Jesus until you love people you don't like. You'll never be a soul winner until you love people you don't like. You'll never be obedient to Jesus until you love people you don't like. You'll never have a successful marriage. I am a professional marriage counselor. I'm not looking for marriages to counsel. I don't do that anymore. I've been delivered from that ministry. But I can tell you this, 100% of the people that I have counseled, their marriages were not destroyed because of unfaithfulness or pornography or any of the other things that they blame their marriages failures on. It's simply this, they don't love their closest neighbor. They married somebody they like because that's the, that's the American way. We look around, we find somebody we like. The problem is, is a week or a month or a year after we get married, we wake up and there are days we don't like them very much. And if you wonder how me and my wife got to 33 years being married on Friday of this past week, it was because there was a lot of days we chose to love when we didn't like each other's. We live in a motorhome. We don't have a house to go home to. We don't have anywhere to escape to. We have survived because we have learned to love our neighbor as ourselves. 
It's a problem in our world. That's what's going on in the Middle East. Jews don't love their neighbors, Arabs. Arabs don't love their neighbors, Jews. So going on in Ukraine and Russia, that's what's wrong in America. Republicans don't like Democrats, and Democrats don't like Republicans because they're not like us. But we're not called to be of this world. We need to fill our pews with people we have loved. Your pastor said it. They don't care what you know until they know that you love them. Praise God. It's so good to be with you all here today. If you're interested in buying a book or talking more about the book, and uh, it's got a lot more than that. I'm going to even actually preach a little bit from the book tonight, or for, it, actually the, from the Bible, but it's in the book. And uh, praise God. But um, uh, if you're interested, please uh, see us after service. We'd be glad to sell you a book. The price is set by the uh, publisher. At least for the first year, we're agreed that we won't sell the book less than what the publisher's selling it online. And so that's what we're doing because we try to we try to be honorable to our agreements. And uh, so if you're interested, paperbacks are $26. I have one hardback left until I get resupplied. If anybody's interested in that, it's $39. Um, and I thank God for opening the doors for us to travel. I thank God for your pastor, however it was that he gave me a call, how whoever told him about me or whatever he saw on YouTube, there's lots of things to see. There might even be some embarrassing stuff, so don't look too hard. Praise God. But it's good to be with you all here today. Praise God, praise God. And I, I have come with purpose in my heart, purpose in my soul. I want to reach out to God's people. I want to reach out to people that want to be God's people. I'm reaching today for two people, two kinds of people. One, you came here today wondering who you are. Am I valuable? Am I wanted? Am I desired? You may look good as you sit there in your pew, but I know from experience that you can sit on a pew and feel like you've got no future. Nobody wants you. I'm reaching for you today. You need to leave here knowing how God sees you. You need to leave here knowing how God views you and how God values you. If you already know that today, I'm, I'm also reaching for you because if you didn't know it, you are to be an instrument of that love. You are to be an instrument of that awareness. You either need to be loved today or you should be loving other people. I'm reading today from Genesis chapter 1. Thank you, Pastor, for having me. And uh, um, I, I uh, want to share this thought with you. In fact, I'm traveling because of this particular thought. For many years, I was in, a, in, in teaching school. I taught at Urshan Graduate School for many years. God revealed this and other thoughts about loving your neighbor to me. God began to speak to me about traveling and taking this message to the churches. I was very comfortable. I enjoyed teaching. It was a lifelong goal. I wanted to live and die at Dershing Graduate School. I'll be honest with you. But God had another purpose. And in 2017, after twisting my arm, I was let go from the school, and we have been traveling ever since. And the sermon that I want to share with you, although it has changed, it's different, and it may not even be recognizable by other places that I've done it, this is the 93rd time, the 93rd time in the last decade that I have stood in a pulpit, and I have shared these thoughts with somebody. I don't say that uh, in any attempt to brag, but just to understand how important this is. When I understood what I'm about to share with you, it changed my life. I've been in this all my life. I've been a preacher now for over 40 years. I came back. My dad was military, but he was a preacher. I came back to Illinois, where we were from in 1977, 
I'd already been preaching a little bit, and I'd been preaching pretty much ever since, even though I did a stint in the military, and, and I've pastored different churches. But it wasn't until about 2010 I began to understand what I'm about to share with you. Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, starting with verse number 1. In the beginning, God. Say it with me. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It's amazing how many times we read Genesis chapter 1 and we miss the prologue. We miss the main verse. We miss the first thought. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In academic circles, there's all kinds of people that believe all kinds of things about the first chapter of Genesis. And, and, and everywhere I go, somebody's got a pet theory that they want to run by me. You know, is it seven days or was it seven 1,000-year days because every day to God is a 1,000 years? Or, or could it be that there's a just an order of first he did this and second? I really don't know. First of all, I wasn't there. I know I looked that old, but I wasn't there. The point of Genesis chapter 1 is that whatever happened in Genesis chapter 1, God did it. Whatever you decide about Genesis chapter 1 and 15 or Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27 or any of the other verses, all of that is built off of one premise that God did it. Sometimes we make a mistake when we argue with an evolutionist. Now, I'm not an evolutionist. I really don't believe my great-great-grandfather was a monkey. Now, some people might debate with me that knew him, but, but the reality is I'm not an evolutionist. I don't, I don't believe that my great ancestor was an amoeba on the Mediterranean Sea that crawled out and became a human. But if I get to heaven, and when I walk down the streets of gold, I find out the reality that my grandfather was a monkey. And that my great-great-grandfather was an amoeba on the Mediterranean Sea. It changes nothing about the Word of God because in the beginning, God did it. Next time some evolutionist talks to you, he says, what about evolution? Look at him back and say, what about it? If it's true, God did it. Did you know that God would have to be greater than he already was for evolution to be possible? He would have had to map into your DNA the ability to change from an amoeba to a lizard to something else to something else to something else to become a monkey and lose your tail and sit down and go to college and get a degree. He'd have had to map that into your DNA. Now, I'm not an evolutionist. Please don't leave here and think that I am. But I'm trying to hammer home a point is that in the beginning, because if you're going to understand and accept and believe what I preach here today, you have to understand that God did it. You're not an accident. You're not just a happenstance. You didn't walk through the doors of this building just because it was a coincidence. I may not know exactly how I ended up here tonight, Pastor, but one thing I know is that my God's got a divine order. In the beginning and since the beginning, when he creates humanity, when, when a fetus first becomes conceived in a womb, it was created in his image. It doesn't matter. If that fetus will grow up to be Hitler or Mussolini, Mussolini or GTA would, I'm here to tell you that when they were first birthed inside of a womb, they were created in God's image. In the beginning, God created. And so he stepped, as academics say, ex nihilo, out on nothing. They step out on nothing, and he began to create. First, he creates the lights and the earth and the, and the waters and the land. And you, you know how it goes in there. And however it was, God did it. Finally, the grass began to grow. 
as the sun began to shine for the first time, seeds that God created begin to grow in the grass and the trees, and, and God began to cruise across the face of the earth, and he paused and said, I, yeah, elephants, that's what I'll do, and mice, and squirrels, and, and chipmunks, and ducktail platypus. What a laugh that might have, must have been when he built that reared shaped animal. Every rodent, every deer, every moose, the walrus crawling up on the shore in the Arctic, the seal sleeping in the, in the Arctic seas. He created them all. The eagle, the duck, the quail, the mosquito, he created them all. In the beginning, God created them, each one with a very sophisticated DNA structure. But then on the sixth day, he paused. Paused long enough to do something different than anything else that he had done. It was different in the fact that it really wasn't different at all. Because in verse number 26, it says, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. You see, the devil doesn't want you to read this verse. The world don't want you to read this verse. It doesn't matter who you are today. In the beginning, you were made in his likeness. You were created in his image. And not only does he create you, it'll look like him. It says, and let them have dominion over the fish of the seas and over the fowls of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that ever creepeth upon the face of the earth. When's the last time you sat on a dock, threaded a worm on a hook, and realized that dominion was given to you in the likeness of God? You see, the devil don't want you to recognize the God-given properties. You see, an elephant never milked a goat. No, an eagle never saddled a horse. Hallelujah. A donkey never herded cattle or butchered anything or no no only man has those abilities they were created in his image not only do they look like his image but they act like that's what you were born to be but the devil wants you to think that when your image was broken that it no longer looks like him but verse number 27 says so god created man in his own image in the image of God created he him. Male and female created he him. Sorry, guys, you weren't the only ones created to look like God, but he created women to look like him too. I know the world has become a patriarchal culture has made men in charge, but I'm here to tell you that in the beginning when God created us, we were equal in his sight. He made us in his image. He made us, and if there's any doubt, verse 31 says, and God saw everything that he had made. Why don't somebody say everything? God saw everything that he had made. Me, pastor, you, the people that prayed and the people that were prayed for, the people that came here saved and the people that came here needed to be saved. The people here that came and life is good. The people that came and life was not good. Hallelujah. Everything that God has made. Behold, it was very good. Very Good. You see, the devil doesn't want you to look at the mirror and look at yourself and say, ah, very good. 
So you look in the mirror and you're too tall, too short, too fat, too skinny, too smart, too dumb, too gray, too young, too old. And the list goes on and on and on, too different, too weird, too whatever. But the reality is even though sin and life and age may have broken you and changed you, the reality is that the very root of who you are was somebody created in his image. Tonight, I want to preach to you from this title. And if you could help me imprint it upon your brain, turn to somebody nearby, look at them, look at them in the eye. Hallelujah. Look at them really good. Hallelujah. Look at them straight in the eye and say, excuse me. Excuse me. Did you know you look like God? Yeah, really, no, say it again. They don't believe you. They don't believe you. Tell them again like you really mean it. Did you know you look like God? You were made in his image. You were not made to look like this world. I know that the the impediments of life, uh, hallelujah, makes you look different today. Uh, But I'm here to tell you, I'm here to remind you, uh, hallelujah, that if you look closely at every broken piece uh, of your life, uh, you were made in his image. Change is the way you It changes the way you act. It changes the way you live. It changes the way you're married. It changes the way you parent. It changes the way you go to church. It changes the way you witness. It changes the way you love your neighbor when you realize that they may be a drunk broken from this world, but underneath it all, they were made in this image. Let me just give you a biblical example. Story tells us in Genesis chapter 30 and 31 about two boys that were born, born to Isaac, two baby boys. The Bible said the first one was named Esau. We don't know for sure what Esau means. There's some disagreement on scholars because you got to understand Jewish words don't have, don't have syllables. So if you would look at the word Harry, in 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 written out in Hebrew word, it would say Esau, or it would have the vowel or the vowels, not the vowels, but the consonants of Esau. And if you saw the word red, it had the consonants of Esau. What makes them different is the vowels. The problem is they have no vowels. It really doesn't matter which one Esau was, whether he was red or whether he was hairy. It's hard to know. But it does make sense why a daddy might look down at his boy and call him Red. My my father-in-law, they called him Red for very good reasons. He had red hair at one time. And maybe if somebody had a lot of hair, you'd call him Harry. But he also looked at Jacob. History doesn't explain it. We don't really understand why. All we know in the Bible is clear, and there's no doubt what Jacob means. The Bible even translates it from ancient Hebrew to modern Hebrew and says, Jacob, it means supplanter. Supplanter is Elizabethan English from the 17th century, but the word in the 21st century that would be translated from the Hebrew word Jacob means deceiver, con man. Eight days old, two babies. We'll call you red, and we'll call you deceiver. It becomes a nature versus nurture argument. Did Jacob become a deceiver because of his name, or did he become Jacob because of his nature? We really don't know, but we do know that by the time he's a teenager, he's become a deceiver. He stands at a fire when his brother comes in from hunting with his game bag empty, and he says, hey, big boy, let me trade you some beans for your birthright. That don't mean much to you and me in America because we don't understand the culture. But in Jacob's day, the younger was a slave to the elder. The younger, the scripture said, serves the elder. But that was translated during a time of slavery and to soften the impact. The real word serve means slave. Jacob was destined to be a slave to Esau. But when he was just a teenager, he convinced his brother Esau to trade his 
his his birthright, his right to be the master, his right to be somebody. He traded it for a bowl of beans. The deception doesn't end there, but when he's older, reaching manhood, his father takes ill and thinks he's going to die. He doesn't die. He lives many more years, but at this point, he thinks he's going to die. And so he tells, he calls for Esau and says, I'm going to bless you. Go get me some game and, and make my favorite food. And, and yet, you know the story, Jacob, the deceiver, he runs out and gets a sheep and he, his mother cooks it just like a deer and he serves it to his father and deceives him. And so now Jacob leaves his home. He leaves his parents. He's running for his life because he saw his man. He's not only stole his birthright, he stole the blessing. And he heads out. He ends up at his mother's brother's house, Laban. And you'd think it would have been a time to start over, but the Bible's pretty clear. He still lives the life of deception. He deceives Laban out of his daughters, his camels, his sheep, his donkeys, his, his everything, until finally the Bible tells us he's fleeing for his life because Laban wants to kill him. And he's heading to the only place he knows to go now, back to mom and daddy. Surely there will be mercy in mom and daddy's house. Surely Isaac will take me back. The Bible says when he was en route back to his home, he gets word that his brother Esau is coming to meet him with 400 men of war. I don't know about you, but if you find out your brother's coming to the family picnic with 400 men of war, he's not coming to eat watermelon, honey. He's coming to exact justice for the injustice that the deceiver had put upon him. You think if there was ever a time to be different, Jacob would be different now, but no, he sends the wife he doesn't like that much out ahead so that in case he saw it is violent and Esau wants to exact a blood payment, he'll kill the wife I don't like and kill her children. And I'll send some donkeys and some sheep and, and I'll get them. And then he gets to thinking maybe that's not going to be enough. So I'll send out the wife I do like and her children and more gifts. And, and now Jacob, big old tough deceiver, he's in the back trying to hide from his brother. And the Bible said that he goes down to the Jacob's Valley or Jacob's, Jabok's crossing. Jabok just means, is the Hebrew word for wrestling, a place to wrestle. And there the Bible says in Genesis 32 and 24, and Jacob was left alone and there he wrestled with a man we know now to be a theophany or a, a personage of God until the breaking of day. Verse 25, and when he saw that he prevailed not against him, the angel, the theophany, touched the hollow of his thigh. And Jacob's thigh was out of joint, so as he wrestled with him, and the angel said to Jacob, let me go, for the day breaketh. And Jacob said, I will not let you go except you bless me. And he said unto him, what is thy name? And he said, Jacob, can you imagine wrestling with an angel? And the question he asked you when your name is deceiver, what is your name? Why would he say that? Because it was time for Jacob to change. It was time for his name to change. And so the angel says, thy name shall no more be called Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince thou hast power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. And Jacob asked him and said, tell me thy name. And that's a sermon worth preaching, but we won't stop there. Wherefore is it that thou did ask my name? And the angel blessed Jacob there. Now notice, I told you all the story to read to you, verse 30. And then another verse in chapter 33, hallelujah, in 32 and 30, notice what it says, and Jacob called the place Peniel. And then the scriptures translates the Hebrew word Peniel. It means, for I have seen God. 
face to face. I have seen God face to face. Jacob's had experiences with God. He's had angels ascend and descend from heaven as he slept. He, he, he's been in the presence of sacrifices and he knew Yahweh that his father worship. But now for the first time he sees God face to face. Notice now, if we skip to Genesis chapter 33, he climbs back up out of Jacob's valley. He continues on his journey, and finally, he meets Esau in the field or in the way, and he says, Esau says to Jacob, what meanest thou by the drove that I have met? And Jacob said to Esau, these are to find grace in the sight of my Lord. And Esau says, I have enough. Keep thou what thou hast to thyself. Notice now the words of Jacob. And Jacob said to Esau, Nay, I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, then receive my present at my hand. For therefore I have seen thy face. Jacob says, for I have seen thy face, Esau, as though I had seen the face of God. For almost 80 years, I've been a deceiver. For almost 80 years, I've deceived you, Esau. For almost 80 years, I've walked as the con man in this world. But today when I see you, Esau, your life is broken. Your life is a sinner. The Bible said that God hated Esau. And yet, when Jacob saw Esau, he said, last night, I saw the face of God. And now when I see you, I don't see the man that I've spent a lifetime deceiving. I see that you look like God. You see, when we realize uh, who people were created to be, uh, who they look like, they were created in this image, uh, it changes the way hey, hey, that we treat them. No longer than we can scream at drivers as we're driving down the road just because they did something that might not have made sense to us. Uh, uh, no longer can we hang out the window and scream at homeless people and tell them to get a job. Because if you look past the filth and you look past the stains uh, and you look past the sins, they were created just like you were. Yes, broken. I'm not approving of any sin today. I'm here to tell you that's the devil's way of marring who you really are. He wants you to look in the mirror and see your sins. He wants you to look in the mirror and see your mistakes. He wants you to look in the mirror and see your brokenness. But this preacher has come tonight to tell you, excuse me, don't listen to the devil. You look like God. You were made in his image. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I don't have time or strength to tell you about the prodigal son. But let me just touch briefly on the prodigal son. You see, the prodigal son was seen differently by the father than by the elder brother. The one who lived a riotous life ends up in a pig pen. When he's in the pig pen, he says, I the servants in my father's house have bread enough to eat. I shall arise and I shall go home and I shall ask my father. I might be a servant or again, the Hebrew word there is slave. I'll be my father's slave. What he didn't know is years had come and gone and his father had stood by the side of the road. We don't know how many fatted calves that he raised, but fatted calves only fed calves for a few a few months, and then they become cows. And so every few months, the father had to start another fatted calf. Someday my boy's coming home, stood by the side of the road. And the Bible said that when the prodigal son was a long ways off, 
His father recognized him. You know why? He just walked a certain way. Hallelujah. It was the tilt of his head. You see, when we see prodigals, we see prodigals. We see their sins. We see the pig pen. We sell the sin, the spell of, of, of a disastrous life poorly lived, but not the father. He sees the son. He didn't see pigs. He didn't see slop. He didn't see tattered robes. He didn't see an emaciated body from sin. He saw a son. But the brother, but the brother, the brother who had always been a good boy, the brother that always served well, he was angry because they killed the fatted calf. He was angry because they gave him a robe to wear and a ring for his finger. And you know why he was angry? Because he didn't see a brother. He didn't see a son. He saw a prodigal. He saw the sins. That's what the devil wants us to see. We'll never have revival until prodigals walk through the door and we see sons and we see daughters and we see brothers. And we see sisters, while others saw a prodigal, the father saw a son. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Must we be reminded tonight of the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 25, when he said, and as much as you've done to the least of these, you've done it unto me. Hallelujah. Oh, God, help us to change. When we walk down the streets of Grafton, the devil wants you to see the sins. But God wants you to see his people created in his image. I stand here not as one that's perfected this, but I stand here as one repenting. I stand here as one that has made a mistake over and over again. Because there are times if I had noticed the face of God, I would have been kinder. I would have been more patient. I would have been more generous. I would have took more time. I would have loved more and hated less. I would have been more tolerant. You see, for me, for me, they have to be more than just another group of immigrants. They have to be another group than just another group of illegals. Let the government do what the government must do. But let the children of God, hallelujah, see the migrants as a people created in his image. Hallelujah. You start loving people, they're going to walk through that door. Hallelujah. If you see them as illegals, they're going to walk right back out the door. But if you see them as a people made in his image, broken, yes, sinners, yes, criminals, yes, but I'm here to tell you, they were made in his image just like me. <laughs> the old people down the nursing home need to be just more than wrinkled old people. They too, if you look past the wrinkles and the gray hair and the dementia, they were made in his image. The homeless people sleeping in your parks, they have to be more than that. They have to be people made in his image. They just need somebody to see it. Somebody to see what nobody's ever seen. Hallelujah. And the welfare people got to be more than just somebody to tolerate the mentally ill. 30% of our country is diagnosably mentally ill. If 30% of our churches are not mentally ill, is it not because we have not loved them and seen beyond the brokenness? Thank you, brother, for talking about the rehab. Hallelujah. When you, brother, walk into the rehab, the temptation is going to be to see their brokenness. It's going to be to see their past of drugs and alcohol and crimes. Uh, but I'm here to tell you, if you look beyond that, uh, they're not prodigals. They're men and women made in the image of God. I have to see more than their differences. I have to see more than their abilities or inabilities. I have to see more than their otherness. I have to see more than color or race or ethnicity or nationality. 
I have to see more than intellect. I have to see more than clothing and finances. I have to see people that were made in his image. People that, yes, beyond the brokenness, look like God. As I come to a close, I want to tell you a story. A story that happened to me when God was first revealing this story to me, this lesson to me. Clear back around 2010, I was working as a hospice chaplain. I was going to school for my first doctorate and in an effort to pay the bills, I was working as a hospice chaplain in that St. Louis area. One morning when I got up, I was getting ready to go to work. A nurse called on the phone. I've answered on my work form, phone. And first words that she said when I answered the phone, she said, Chaplain, please don't say no. Please don't say no. I said, what do you mean, don't say no? And she said, well, the other chaplain said no, and I really need you to come. I said, why did they say no? And she said, well, I'm, I'm at a house. I'm at a house with one of those women, and they don't want to come. I asked the question she didn't want me to ask. I said, what do you mean one of those women? She said, Joey, the woman's a lesbian. She's dying from HIV. I'll be honest, my apostolicity, if that's a word, reared up. I didn't want to go either. I didn't want to go be part of that. But for some reason, back in 1974, I made a promise to God that I would never say no. When somebody called, I had to go. This led me to some of the most unbelievable places and ministries in this world. And once again, I found myself saying, yes, I'll come. It was over 100 miles from my home to where this woman was dying. But I had my schedule rearranged and... Several hours later, I approached the farmhouse. This event was to take place. When I pulled into the yard, there was a party going on. Alcohol and drugs was obviously being used. About 30 people filled the yard, many of them drinking or having drink, several of them in different stages of being undressed. I didn't want to be there. But I knew it was the right place. The nurse's car was there. So I parked my car and I got out and I walked up on the porch. There on the porch was an elderly lady sitting there on a bucket, a five-gallon bucket with her head on the railing. I knelt down beside her. She collapsed into my arm, crying, sobbing and sobbing and sobbing. She cried for some time, maybe 10 or 15 minutes, and finally she sobered up enough to tell me I'm the mother. I'm the mother of Sarah. We'll call the woman that was dying Sarah. We won't use her name. I don't even remember her name. Long since been forgotten. She said, I'm Sarah's mother. She said, thank you, chaplain, for coming. She stood up and I stood up and she said, let me take you inside the house and let me introduce you to Sarah's partner. I'm still an ordained minister of the apostolic movement of UPC, but I was trapped in a place I didn't want to be, trapped by a promise I'd made God not to the UPC, but to God. I walked into that kitchen with that woman. She introduced me to Sarah's partner. The kitchen was full of either empty or half drinking beer bottles and alcohol bottles and Music was blaring so loud you can hardly hear yourself think. I went over to the table where the partner was sitting. I literally had to push paraphernalia, drug paraphernalia, over to the side so I could lay my Bible on the table when I sat down. Hospice ethics would not allow me to introduce Jesus unless she introduced him. So all I could do was talk about whatever she wanted to talk about. And so... 
we talked about different things, and I don't even remember what we talked about, but after about 10 minutes, she she stood up and she said, let me take you back to see Sarah. And so she turned and headed down the hallway, and I just followed right behind. The last door on the left, I still dream about this today, and these days, I'm, I'll dream about it tonight. Every time I tell the story, I remember it like it happened yesterday. She went to the last door on the left, and I followed her in, only to be in the most bizarre death scene I've ever been in. The room was empty. There was no bed. There was no dressers. There was no chairs. Just an empty room and a woman laying on a mat on the floor in the middle of the room, dying. Her body emaciated by HIV. Her life was literally at the very brink of death. She was unconscious. I was stunned. In my mind, I was screaming, God, what am I doing here? What am I doing here? This is hopeless. This is impossible. How can there be a work for me to do in this place? As I looked around the room, I noticed on the wall, about eye level, all the way around the room, religious icons. As I began to look at them, it was the Sacred Heart of Mary from the Catholic Church. It was the Methodist flame, Eastern Orthodox communion, even a Pentecostal dove, and on around the room until we had a Jewish menorah, and we had a Muslim symbol, and on around the room, and puzzled at what this meant, I turned to Sarah's partner. And I said, what, what does this mean? She looked at me, and she said, well, chaplain, it's a long story. And I said, I've got the time. Tell me. So she said, you know, chaplain, I met Sarah in college. She said, I didn't know when I met her, but neither one of us had ever been to church, ever, ever, for no reason. Never been to a church for a wedding, never been to a church for a funeral, never been to a church, ever. We met in college, we fell in love. We got out of college, we bought this farmhouse. We both got a job down at the county, we became social workers for the county. For many years, we lived here, and 10 years ago about, she said, we were sitting out there at that table. She said, I don't even remember which one of us said it, but she said, one of us looked at the other and said, what do you know about church? She said, it was the first time we'd ever talked about Christianity, first time we ever talked about church. It was then we discovered that neither of us had ever been to church of any kind. No church ever. And so we talked about it and realized neither one of us knew anything about it. So maybe we should go to church. Sounded like a pretty good idea. She said, so we just, not by any particular design, we just went to the church down the road. She said that we went there one Sunday morning and we really liked the singing. The preacher preached some good sermon and told some good stories and we really enjoyed it. So we went back. Four or five weeks after we started going, after church on the Sunday morning, she said the preacher asked to speak to us in his office. And they were informed that the church board had decided that it might be better that they don't go to church there anymore. And so they left. But in hope that surely not all Christians would reject them, she said we went to another. But only it happened again. And we went to another and it happened again. She said at some point we started Gathering mementos from the church. And that's what you see on the wall. Each one of these icons are from churches that threw us out. And we hung them on the wall one by one. 
And Sarah wanted to die in the midst of the icons of churches that rejected us. Now, let me tell you something. If you just went to church once it got rejected and never went back, that's one kind of story. But if you go to 10 different churches, if you go to 20 different churches, something inside of you is looking for something. You're looking for, surely they were hungry for something. At this time in the story, tears are running down my face. I was greatly disturbed by such a terrible story. Surely God, surely God wanted to save their soul. Yes, God, they they had broken lives. Yes, they were sinners. Yes, God wasn't pleased with their behavior, but yes, they were still made in the image of God. God wanted to save them. God wanted to heal them. About this time when I'm trying to figure out what to do next, the partner said, Chaplain, Sarah would like to spend time alone with you. She said, would that be all right? I actually jerked around. I thought maybe Sarah had regained consciousness. But when I looked on the floor where she laid, she was still there and she was still dying. She was still unconscious. And then my mind trying to make sense of things, I thought, well, maybe she had said weeks ago that in the last days and moments, she'd like to spend time with a preacher. And so I told the partner, yes, I'll spend time with Sarah. So the partner left. She closed the door. And I stand there. I have no chair to sit in. I have no bed to sit on. Sarah's down here on the floor. I wasn't as healthy as I am now. I'm disabled from the military. I just went through a series of surgeries with the military and I still hadn't completely recovered from it all. And so I was, I was at my, at the very end of my strength. And so I did the only thing I could think of in an empty room. I sat down on the ground, just sat down next to Sarah. Remember there's a party going, there's music blaring. I did the only thing I could think of pastor. I'm not trying to be prescriptive. I'm not trying to tell you this is what you should do. But I just begin to pray. Sitting there in a room with a dying woman. A woman whose broken life, her sins were taking her to the grave. I sat there. I weeped. I prayed. I I wasn't worried about anybody hearing me. There was a, a party going on. And so I began to pray. While I was praying, I remembered when I was dying in 1974, the room where I was, my mom would put a rocking chair and she'd come in there and she'd pull my six foot tall body out of the bed and wrap a sheet around my emaciated body. And she would rock me and she would sing to me the songs of my babyhood. Jesus loves you. And so I did the unthinkable. I wrapped the sheet tight around Sarah. I pulled her off the mat. I pulled her into my lap. I laid her head on my shoulder. I said, God, don't let Sarah die until she understands that somebody saw that she was born and made in your image. No, it wasn't going to save her. No, it wasn't going to change her. But everybody deserves to know that Jesus loved them. Jesus created them. I rocked her and I sang to her the songs that my mama sang to me. At the top of my lungs, I just sang, Jesus loves you, Sarah. Jesus loves you. Yes, I know. For the Bible tells me so. I rocked her for about a half an hour. And at some point, I realized that Sarah was dead. She had died there in my arms. I thought, oh God, forgive the church for not loving this woman when she was alive. As she went from church to church looking for something, God, why didn't she find you? Why didn't she find somebody that could love her? And now... As a hospice chaplain, I got a job to do. So I laid her back on the mat. 
I folded her arms. I closed her eyes. I arranged the sheet so everything looked proper and in orders. Slowly, I got to my feet. My legs were asleep. My legs were in pain. I had to stamp them, try to get life back into them. Finally, I could stand alone. And so I would open the door and I headed out. And when I opened the door, suddenly it dawned on me that somebody had turned the music off. It was quiet. I couldn't hear nothing. What happened to the party? As I headed down the hallway, I noticed in the living room off to the left, all those people that had been out there having a party were now crammed and silent in the front room. Their backs were to me. I thought, oh, God, what's going on? And I, I walked down, and I, I come up behind them, and I looked over their shoulder, only to realize that on the wall in the living room was a large television, and somewhere back in that room was a television camera projected onto that screen. They had watched me cry. Maybe it was too late for Sarah. Maybe it was too late to reach for her. But here was a group of people that had lived their life in sin. God only knows what they lost out of Christianity. God only knew what they thought of preachers. God only knows what they thought of churches. But today when they turned to face me, tears were running down their eyes. Everybody wanted me to hold them. Everybody wanted to cry. Everybody wanted the chaplain to pray. Four hours later, when I left there, I had prayed with all of them. I had cried with all of them. <laughs> From that day, I thought, oh, God, God gave me that story. So that today in Grafton, I could tell it to you. You see, walking the streets of Grafton in this county, this state, are thousands and thousands of Sarah that are going to die unloved, unwanted. Uh, hallelujah, because the devil has convinced them every day they look in the mirror with suicide is becoming the number one killer in our country. It's the number one killer of deaths. Suicide. It's because they stand and look at themselves in the mirror. And they feel unloved and unwanted. But this preacher's come to tell you, yes, you're a sinner. And so am I. Yes, you're broken. Yes, so am I. Yes, yes, I've made lots of sins. I've made lots of mistakes. Yes, I know. The devil wants me to look and see those sins when I look in the mirror. Those mistakes. He wants me to remember them every day. But what God wants me to remember, I was made in his likeness. I was created in his image. I was born to serve the Lord. Pastors call me from all over the country. They say, Brother Payton, what's the best outreach program? Can I tell you, it doesn't matter what outreach program you work. It just matters that you love people. I guarantee you, take it for somebody who has spent his life researching, I'll guarantee you, you can take any two programs in the world, and if you love them, they will respond. And if you don't, they will not. Everybody that is here grounded in Jesus Christ today, if we are honest, we're not here because of our own goodness, but somebody loved us. When I was a teenager, my life was such in shambles health-wise. I'd had cancer. I'd been born with birth defects. I, I, I had all kinds of things wrong. But you know why I'm here? When all the other kids went to play in the park on Sunday afternoon and when they played baseball, I couldn't go. And when the girls were looking for dates, they didn't choose me. I was all alone. But you know what? People that nobody remembers loved me. Brother and Sister Kimball would take me home. 
because nobody took me home. They would talk to me about Jesus. They made me feel that Jesus loved me. If he would have talked to the Kimbos before I died, they would say, oh, we didn't do nothing. We didn't know how to do nothing. Mm -hmm. We didn't have any kind of program. We were, we were just trying to be nice. They had no program, but they loved me. And it worked. And it worked. 40 years of ministry, when I get down, I remember that the Kimbles loved me. I remembered an old preacher named Herschel E. Dick dying in the home with me when I was just 16 years old. And in his will, he left me his library. And in storage today, I have books that are stamped in the front that say, from the library of Herschel E. Dick, started a life of love for God's word a life of researching the Bible. When I think of quitting, I remember old brother and sister Rice. Nobody remembers some of you. If you called the church today where I went to church as a teenager, nobody remembers any of the people I just mentioned. Nobody but me. But I am who I am today because somebody made me realize Jesus loved me, that even though my life was broken health-wise, and even though I had deformities that, that nobody liked, I was still broken, but I was still made in this image. I've come to tell you today, the devil's a liar. He don't want you to see you as who you are. So if you came here today and you felt broken, unloved, unwanted, unvalued, I come here to tell you, God sent me here to tell you, you are loved. You were made in his image. And if you already knew that, your job is to tell others, to communicate it to others. You look like God. Yes, yes, you do. The devil wants you to think otherwise, but I've come as a messenger from God to tell, me, to tell you, excuse me, you look like God. God bless you, Pastor.